open your Bible real quick. We're going to start with one little verse of section of Scripture just to get our minds in the right place this morning. If you have a Bible there, open it to 1 Corinthians 15. And I know I do this to our choir because they don't have their Bible up here with them. So they just stand and watch. And so if anyone's not participating, they'll throw things at you this morning. Just kidding. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're talking about the resurrection of Christ this morning. And so if you would, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look down at verse 16, and we'll read it. I'll read verse 16 down through verse 19, and then we'll all read verse 20 together. Verse 16 says, For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. What a hopeless sound, isn't it? Then they also which are fallen asleep, or those that have died in Christ, are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now let's all read verse 20 together. Ready? But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed, and we're thankful for that. Let's let our minds think on that this morning. Some of our hymns, our songs, our message today, all to the fact that there is hope in a living Savior. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Father, thank you for your words this morning, that it is true as we read it. We know that you are alive, that you came as a man. We've been studying the book of Matthew, and we read even all the way back from the beginning of the book, how you came in the form of a man, fully God, yet fully man, born of a virgin, that you lived a perfect and sinless life, that you are righteous, that you are holy, and that you lived in this world not apart from or separate from the things that we struggle with, but touched by and grieved by those very same things. You suffered. Uh, you dealt with the same temptations that we do, and yet all without sin. And on our behalf, you went to a cross, and we've studied that these last few weeks, and you died for us. As this morning, we get ready to look to your word again. There is something much greater than just your life here and your ministry. All those things are good, but unless they can change us, affect us, and save us from our sins, it means nothing to us. And so we thank you this morning that you are living, that you have risen from the dead. May we rejoice and respond in our own lives. As we sing, may we think on those things. May we remove the distractions. <laughs> may you remove the distractions of our lives from our mind for a moment. May we focus on what is real. Things around us seem very real. Our troubles, our difficulties all seem so real to us. They're the biggest things in this moment of our life. But your word has told us that we will all live forever. If we have believed in you, we will live with you forever. And so we thank you for that thought. Thank you for eternity and for the life of Jesus, that he lives on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. As Christians, we have a different hope than anyone else in this world, don't we? Open, if you would, to Matthew 28, and as you find your place there, think for a moment like the last verse of that song, Unto the grave what will we sing? You know, the whole world, if you think about it, not to be a downer this morning or discouraging, there's no human being in this world that is living that is not headed to one place in terms of our physical lives. They start and they end. When we are born into this world, we are headed in a direction. No one has ever figured out how to sidestep, Eurostep, cross over and move past death. It doesn't happen. You're headed that direction. But we head that way differently than anyone else because our Savior has risen again because He has promised to do that for all who believe. So unto the grave, what will we sing? How can we sing unto the grave? Because we know that it does not last forever that he restores and resurrects all who believe in him. As you would there in Matthew chapter 28 this morning, if you need a Bible, there should be one there in the seat in front of you. You're welcome to use that, borrow it today. If you don't have a Bible that is yours, then that's our gift to you this morning. Why don't you take it with, it, with you? If you're visiting with us this morning, whatever brings you our way, we're glad 
that you're here. If you're here at the invitation of someone else, a family member, you just came across us, we're glad that you're here. The little welcome bag at the in the foyer at the welcome center, a little brown bag that's back there has the church name on it. We want you to take that with you today, and uh, it gives you some information about our church, and then as well an opportunity for you to give us a little bit of information about how you came to know about our church and how we can serve you as a local church and uh, how we can be a part how you can be a part of our church family. We're thankful that you're here with us today. As you're there in Matthew 28, let me just remind you of a couple things that are in your bulletin this morning there on the back uh, sheet on the very back our missionaries that we're praying for uh, this week over the over the next week we remember uh, both of these uh, in prayer and then as well on the inside uh, the kind of the activity we have an activity or so about every month month and a half or so a church fellowship or a ladies meeting a men's breakfast whatever it may be and uh, this month what was supposed to be last month uh, this month we're having these fellowships over at our house actually and uh, there are some today uh, then this Thursday and next Monday each day there's one at noon and one at six and uh, the purpose of these is just to encourage one another give an opportunity for some of our church members that may not know one another to get to know each other a little bit better way and uh, so I hope that you're planning on uh, coming and attending. You can scan the code there and sign up. There's a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center as well. You can sign up. You say, well, what do you mean today? That's like, you know, 45 minutes from now. Yes, there's a two or three spots left. We have enough food if you want to add on. Now, not everybody can come in 45 minutes. It might be a little overwhelming. Uh, but if you want to sign up and you don't have lunch plans, your guests, whatever it may be, this is for whoever would like to come. Uh, guests, friends, family members, uh, but bring someone with you. Then there's one this evening. You sign up for that as well. There's a couple spots for both of those. And then most of the rest of those are open. We kind of uh, brought this back kind of quickly. And so uh, hopefully we're kind of packing it all into here a, about a week, <coughs> in about a week's uh, time frame. Several of these that we had scheduled were canceled for sickness back in December. And so we want you to do that. We want you to come and be a part of that uh, and just uh, enjoy a little bit of time together as a church family. Uh, church officer meeting next week, and then you see there February 3rd, a little less than a month away, senior adult conference at the Edge Camp, and uh, there's some transportation available. Some of you have, uh, some of you rather drive up back and forth, that kind of thing, and we will get with you and find out exactly what we need, but there will be transportation available if it's needed uh, that day. Bruce Fry, if you've never heard, uh, Bruce Fry has a great testimony. Uh, he was a country singer and moved to Nashville and uh, tried to make it big like many, many people. And uh, the Lord used that moment to get a hold of his life. He has a great testimony for the Lord. And he's a gospel singer and preacher. He's going to be there uh, that day. I hope that you'll uh, go and be a part of that. Old-timey diner-themed lunch and games. I don't know exactly what that means. I think it means smash burgers and some different things, old diner-style food. And uh, but it's going to be a good day. You can also scan there, and that registers through the Edge's website uh, as well. And then uh, one order of church business, if we would, before we read uh, our text this morning. I'm going to ask Ed and Cheryl Jenkins if they would right here, just to stand, and wave at you for a moment. You, how about you wave at them? That'd make it a little less awkward for them. Ed and Cheryl and I, uh, we were able to meet for about an hour or so on Thursday, and. I uh, got to know them a little bit, and they gave me uh, their testimony, and we walked through, and uh, let me just tell you, it's, it's wonderful to hear. I was encouraged when I walked away from the conversation. It's great to hear someone that's so passionate about what God has done in their lives. Uh, both of them were emotional, speaking about uh, the gospel and how God worked in their lives, their testimony, and being saved. Uh, they have served the Lord a number of places and ways, and uh, Brother Ed's helped uh, develop a prison ministry in a couple of different places and assist in different ways. But uh, they are coming for membership in our church today uh, by a statement of faith and a letter from Church of Light Faith as well. And uh, we are glad and pleased to welcome them to our church. And so if you're glad this morning that they're part of our church family, let me know by saying amen. amen. And then you get around, introduce yourself to them. It's odd being the new person. You don't it's odd to introduce yourself to everyone. So you go introduce yourself to them over the next couple of weeks as you see them. And I'm glad that you're here today. And you have seen. We're thankful uh, that they're coming into the membership of our church this morning. Matthew there, chapter 28. Matthew 28, <clears throat> if you would. We're going to be again reading in verse number 1. We have, Lord willing, and if the Holy Spirit doesn't 
change that and kind of lead a different us a different direction. We have two more sermons in the book of Matthew today and, and next week, and uh, then we'll wrap it up. It's always bittersweet, kind of like saying goodbye to an old friend after a while, but the good news is it'll still be there. We can go back and study it anytime you like, but as a church on Sunday mornings, we're going to be done with the book of Matthew, and we come to uh, the crowning moment of the book. If you notice that Matthew is very detailed in how he talks and how he speaks, uh, he speaks, not to belabor is the wrong word, but he gives all the detail of Christ's teachings, whereas other uh, gospel accounts may emphasize something a little bit different, his miracles, his actions. And Matthew speaks much about the words and the spirit of Christ. And there's so much detail as he lays it all out, and now it comes to this crowning moment. We're going to talk a little bit about it in in a second, but it is interesting that it doesn't even tell us exactly the background of the events. It just tells us that it happened, and then everyone else's response. And so we have been at the cross of Christ for a couple of weeks. Then last week we talked about the burial of Jesus, and that even in his burial, God was sending a message to us that he is who he says he is, and he will do what he said he will do. And now we come to the resurrection of Jesus, Matthew 28, verse number one says, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. Now, Jewish culture, Sabbath is on Saturday. Remember that their days run sunset to sunset. So we sort of imagine that our day begins either at midnight, if you look at the clock that way, or just practically we view it as when we wake up in the morning, our day has started. Their day switched sort of just after dinner time. So about 6 p.m. when the sun goes down, They've entered the new day. And so when it says it, it was the end of the Sabbath, Saturday has ended, uh, that 6 p.m. time, and has gone through the night, what we would kind of consider late Saturday night, early Sunday morning. And notice it says, as it began to dawn, uh, as the sun began to come up, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, for fear of the angels, or the angel, make sure it's kind of in your mind. It hasn't changed over to anything. This is the angel, not Jesus. His countenance was as lightning, his raiment white as snow. For fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. They, whether they passed out or pretended, they're laid out on the floor. The angel, uh, and, for fear, and the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly, the women did, from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. It's kind of a formal hello, greetings, rejoice. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch, the guards, came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, this is what you're supposed to say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if it come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Now, I don't know what church background or tradition you are from this morning, depending on the type of church you grew up in or type of churches you've been in. Around Easter time, some every week, but around Easter time, Someone will stand at a pulpit and declare, He is risen, and the congregation responds, 
Ooh, some of you haven't been to that kind of church, have you? Let's try that. He is risen indeed. Ready? He is risen? Thank you, Lord, that you are risen. And that means something because you have extended that resurrection to others. May we trust you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> we want to shout hallelujah. Does the resurrection of Christ make you want to do that? Go ahead. Hallelujah. Oh, that was pathetic. <laughs> Try one more time. Everyone together, hallelujah. Ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah. You say you feel like you're trying to get us to cheer. I am. The commanders are going to do the same thing this afternoon to you. It's not going to work, but it, you're going to try. If you can get excited about that, we can get excited about Jesus being alive this morning, can't we? Let me ask you a question this morning to start. Why are you here? Why are you here this morning? You're quiet. What are you doing here? What's the point of showing up on Sunday morning, singing songs and listening maybe perhaps to an announcement, maybe an update or two, a lovely special encouragement from our friends that sing in the choir? We'll gather around God's Word each week in a type of liturgy. We will open it and read a full passage and then do our best to understand and explain that passage in ancient text that we claim and believe is God's Word. But more than that, why are you here today? Because we come to church? Because these things encourage us? I, I, I was thinking there just a moment ago, my mind is weird, it slips off quite often and I was singing, the ladies were singing, and did you notice that, that it kept kind of repeating some of the same thoughts and phrases? The Scripture does that as well. That's why we keep going back to Scripture, that He is wonderful. Why, does, why do songs repeat? Why does Scripture repeat? Why does Psalm repeat? For His love and kindness and tender mercy over and over, because we're dense, and sometimes we just don't get it the first time. But can you imagine in eternity one day, I think, and I think from Scripture, that Eternity will be what God created this world to be perfected. It won't be some ethereal floating on clouds somewhere playing a harp. We will be doing what God created us to do in the first place. That might mean some of you get to garden. Some of you get to train and work with animals. Some of you get to do all, all kinds of things. And maybe Mr. Young has his garden that he's working on. Some of you others that have gardens and you're sitting side by side. Maybe your houses are near and you call out and you just think about the goodness of of God, and we have no idea how much it cost that He was went to the cross for us. And all of a sudden, just in song, neighbors burst out and start singing. It's going to be a lot like what a church service would be, minus the formality of it. There'll be some worship that just springs out. There'll be conversation, discussion about the goodness of God. But in thinking about it, what it's going to be like, I want to ask you again one more time this morning, not to make you uncomfortable. I just I want you to think, why are you here today? To be encouraged? To be grounded in your faith? Are we here to get away from the world for a while? To be preached to, exhorted, instructed, corrected? To hear about sin and apply new living to our life? Those are results of gathering, but none of them should be the reason why we are gathered this morning. What in the world of all the places and things keeps us coming back and doing this over and over and over again. As Christians, we gather on this day, on Sunday, to declare to the world and to ourselves that something great has happened. Amazing and life-changing, and it is true. And we don't celebrate it one Sunday a year that we may call Easter or Resurrection Sunday, and then we just try to get life chiseled out and work out the puzzle all the other days we come and gather because something happened on a sunday morning two thousand years ago that we just read about some moment during what we would consider the middle of the night something so incredible something so unlike anything else that has ever happened in the history of this world was ex nothing that no one has ever experienced anything like this Something happened that fundamentally changed 
the outlook of every human being that lives in this world that will listen to the gospel of Christ and believe. What happened was so big and so grand and so incredible, so awe-inspiring, so hope-giving, so life-forming that we gather to celebrate it, not just yearly, but weekly. You know, we've won the war for independence. Great, July 4th, boom, fireworks. This is awesome. We celebrate it. But most of us don't wear American flag trousers and, you know, star-spangled sunglasses every day of the year. Most of us don't fire off fireworks every day of the year. We do it once a year to celebrate that big event. Christmas even, other holidays, we celebrate them a certain time. But this is so big. We don't gather once a year. We gather every week. Every single week we call ourselves under the name of the one who did this great thing. Because not only did Jesus do this, but he promises to do it for anyone else that believes. We gather every week on Sunday to declare that we are constantly amazed and continually filled with hope because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Can you fall in love with him anew this morning? He died for us. He was buried. His body laid with no life in it for three days. We saw last week that Jesus was not put into an open grave. He was not put into an ancient tomb with others, but he was placed alone into a new grave of a rich and wealthy man. A stone was placed in front of it. Roman guards were posted there so that nothing could get out and so that no one could go in. Their reasoning was, we don't want anyone to interfere with this crucifixion, with this death. We don't want anyone to fake anything. The problem was, they had accounted for everything on the outside. They had not accounted for who was on the inside. No one went in. No one interfered or assisted Jesus. But the God of the universe who came in human form took a body on like ours. He lived without sin. He was precious and perfect. He had no guilt or shame. He did not deserve death. And yet, he laid his life down and died just like all other humans. He died. He did not sleep for a while. It was not anything unlike a death that you may have seen or experienced of a loved one. The most stunning and baffling, if you would, it's the most unnatural experience any human being could ever go through because we were not created to have an end. God did not create human beings with an end date to die. He created us to live in union with Him forever, but our sin brings about the punishment that is death. And He suffered death as well. He suffered in a unique brutality. He suffered on our behalf. He suffered because of our sin. Our wrath was on him. God's wrath for us was on him. He became sin. It was John Stott who said, before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we must see the cross as something done by us. Our sin led to his death. He lived and he died. His body laid in a tomb with no life in it, no spirit, no soul dwelling inside. Just as all of us, when we die, we are made of different parts, spirit, soul, body, heart, all those things that make up a person different from all the other animals. And when we die, our spirit and soul leave our body, the body that we have been given ends. It stops, it ceases to be able to exist and live the functions of, cease and stop and he died the god who gave all life gave up his own however something else happened because unlike all other humans he lived he died but he lived again he lives again jesus resurrected to new life his soul his spirit entered back into that physical body that laid dormant and dead for those days. It entered back in. And isn't it interesting that this account, really no scriptural account, really tells us anything about that actual event, what happened. You, you know that? You see that? There's a couple of reasons for that. No one was there to witness it. God decided we didn't need the details. It's so miraculous that we couldn't understand it anyway, but it did happen. 
don't have to know every single component. Did his heart beat before he breathed? Did he gasp a breath and that started his heart beating? How, what, what happened? How did it all happen? But we know that it did. Death is a form of judgment on our sin. And we cannot raise to new life like he did. He said, I have the power to lay down my life and to take it up again. But when we believe the gospel and the promise that Jesus made, he made the promise to do the same for all followers and believers of him. As God the Father did not abandon his son to death in the grave, the son will not abandon anyone who trusts in him. 1 Corinthians 15 that we read just a moment ago, Paul makes us think about what life would be like if Jesus had not raised from the dead. He says our faith is useless. It's in vain. What's the point of being a Christian or holding to scriptural values if the resurrection never happened? There is no point. He says we are of all men most miserable if that is the case. So you cannot be a Christian and hold to the principles and values but then just not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. That is what makes you a Christian. That is what gives you hope, claiming that it is not your works or your skill or your ability or your righteousness that makes you right before God, but it is God that has made you right before Him. And as you think about it, I quote it, you can tell maybe who I was reading this week. John Stott also gave a good quote. He said, Christianity is in its very essence a resurrection religion. He uses that word loosely. The concept of resurrection lies at the heart of Christianity. If you remove it, Christianity is destroyed. It does us no good to come and make our lives better. Socializing weekly for a, a while might help, especially in the type of world that we live in, where people live alone and apart from each other. So socializing may have some help, accountability, we live our lives and we, we, we exhort one another to try to live right and love and do good in this world. All those things are good, but they're useless without the resurrection of Christ. Fortunately, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, we read a moment ago, it says this, that Jesus is risen. And so we come. We come on Sunday morning to declare what Jesus did. What he did that day and what he will do again one day. We declare that every person in this room that is claimed and follows Jesus will one day be resurrected to eternal life. We gather each week to declare that that's why we come. We don't come so that our church attendance marks will be faithful. We don't just come to pool our resources and send the gospel around the world. All those things are important. We don't just come to be edified, to be changed, to keep ourselves grounded so that we don't become like the most sin-filled or wickedness of the world. We can do that from within the church pew. That's not why we come. We come every week, just like the first church, the early church did on Sundays, to declare this is what Jesus did for us. We saw it with our very eyes. And though if we have not seen it with our eyes, we believe their account, and we gather each week to declare that we do not forever grieve our believing loved ones that have died but simply we wait a joyous reunion with them because Jesus keeps his promises. The Bible teaches us that they are in God's presence even now, but that someday, no matter if it's hours later, centuries later, if it's 10,000 years later, there will be resurrected bodies. The belief, bodies of believers will be resurrected just like Jesus did. And so we come every week saying, we are headed a certain direction to a certain place end of our physical lives and those that we know around us and that we have loved that believe they went to and came to a physical end in their lives but we believe that just as jesus life did not end in the tomb or in the grave neither will ours and so we come every week to declare that because this is what the this is what we have done this is what christians do so consumed by the hope of the resurrection the impact of the risen Savior, that they every seven days meet to rejoice in it. It's such a big deal that Jesus is alive because you can be alive through Him. Though it has been centuries since this began, we do not relent, not even a little. We don't get 2,000 years away and say, you know what, let's gather 
hey, Carl, we've been doing this thing weekly for 2,000 years. What about monthly? What about yearly? And I, I, don't, I don't say this to, it's not a jab at church attendance, any, anything like that. I, I mean in the sense that the Christian church as a whole in this world says, we believe so fiercely that Jesus is alive that even if the world looks at us as fools, if the neighbor looks out the window and says, every week there's people coming to their house, they're gathering and singing. Every week they're leaving at the same time and they're going to a church place. They're wasting their time. They've been wasting it for 2,000 years. They've been wasting it. We say it is not a waste because Jesus keeps his promise. And so let me ask you again this morning. Why are you here? We get focused on many things. And frankly, sin has distracted some of us from the joy, the beauty, and satisfaction of Jesus this week. For some of us, stress. For some of us, numbers and house and where we live and what our job is. All those things are, can be consuming. But are you here this morning? Because despite what has happened in the last six days, you say today that there is coming a day that Jesus will do in you what he did in himself. Are we distracted? Well, sometimes we actually want to numb ourselves with the very things of this world from which Jesus came to save us. Why are we here this morning? We just celebrated Christmas and started often. We, we stay often. Jesus is the reason for the season. Let's keep focused on why Why celebrating Christmas and we do that once a year at Christmas time but let's think about our weekly gathering why are we here what's the reason it is because we believe that there is a savior that is so fundamentally different from everything else the world has ever presented that our only hope can be in him the resurrection of Jesus is an amazing thing we could take weeks to study it and this is the longest introduction I think I've ever done but do not worry it's part of the sermon. The resurrection of Jesus is an amazing thing. We could take weeks and study, walk through each account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. There's even other historical writings and testimonies of people from that day. We could examine those. There's amazingly helpful books that examine the resurrection from a historical viewpoint. Um, there, there's of the empty tomb, James Montgomery Boyce, uh, read through that a little bit this week, The Case for Christ, uh, Risen Indeed by, is a fully extensive book that examines all the eyewitness accounts and all the things, it pieces together The Case for Christ, more than a carpenter, but for today, all I want to do is focus on what Matthew tells us about the resurrection and the things surrounding it, because he, again, he doesn't give us all of those details. There's no description of the actual resurrection itself. Matthew gives us a few details that are distinct compared to the other three gospel accounts. Matthew tells us a few things that the others don't. It doesn't mean they're not true. It means it's compiled. Matthew is the first gospel written, so others didn't feel they needed to rehash those things. So they didn't state them in the same way. They told other details. The things that Matthew tells us that are different is the earth shaking. The stone being rolled away by a fiery angel. The soldiers falling down as though they were dead. And the unique encounter of the women with Jesus in the way that they did as they were going to tell the disciples. Jesus intercepting those women and the conspiracy of the leaders to cover it up. Those are all unique to Matthew. So I just want to think on those things this morning. It would be great to know what it was like. Did he, did he gasp? Did he breathe? Did he glow when his life entered back into his body? But we don't have those details because God has given us what he knows that we need. And so let's look to that this morning. We just mentioned, we're just going to walk through, really just walk through the verses one time and, and I, th I think it will apply itself as we go. You have some notes there in your bulletin. And look, number one, if you would, very quickly. The shaking. What I want to do for the next few minutes is just take what, what makes Matthew's gospel account unique from the others. It doesn't, uh, we can compile, we do those things. That's not, I just don't feel that that's not what we're going to do this morning. We're just going to look, what does Matthew tell us? How it should apply to our lives? You see, number one, there, the shaking, distinct from the other gospel accounts. Matthew tells us the earth shook, and it tells us why it shook. And what is it telling us? Kind of, we gave it to you there in your notes. What is this? teach us about the resurrection 
that it was powerful, that there was power in this resurrection. Sometimes we would never know that by walking in a church on a Sunday morning, would we? Let's just, let's just let's not point fingers. What about our, our church? Would anybody coming into our church on a random Sunday morning, I don't mean resurrection Sunday morning, on a random Sunday morning know that Jesus rose to new life and that there is power in that resurrection for anyone who believes? Does anybody in our lives know that? Or do we just act like it's a, it's a nice thing? <laughs> It's an award like that we got at work. We hang it on the wall. We never think about it again. And we just don't think that others appreciate it the way that they should. You know, whatever it may be. We, we, we have trinkets and toys and things in our house that are put on a shelf. And it's just there. We show people from time to time. But is the resurrection of God have power in your life? In Matthew, an earthquake occurs at the moment that Jesus breathes out his last breath. What? For, because the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. So the earth shook, not because Jesus rose to new life, though he could do whatever he wanted in that power, but because God was sending someone down to earth to communicate and let others know that Jesus is alive. So it doesn't diminish the power of the resurrection that the earthquake didn't happen when he breathed in and was raised from the dead. But what it shows us is that God is displaying this message to us. What has happened is such a big deal. I will shake the earth to get people to notice it. Sometimes we, we think that God doesn't want people to be saved. We kind of picture that he's against everyone and because of sin and all these things he hates everyone. No, God shakes the earth and rents things in half. And here is this angel that is sent down. Notice the angel doesn't come to give Jesus life. The angel doesn't even say it ever even went in the tomb. He rolls the stone away and sits on it. Why? Because Jesus didn't need the angel for anything. We did. We needed the angel to roll back the stone so that our eyes would be focused on the right thing. Notice Mary and the other Mary, they're traveling there. It says to see the tomb, literally to kind of sit and look at it. They're actually in other portions or other gospel accounts. It says that they had bought, that they had gotten some spices, that they were going to anoint the body of Christ, most likely because he had died just before uh, those days in the Sabbath. They weren't able to kind of prepare as quick or as much as they wanted they couldn't buy spices on the sabbath and so now the sabbath has ended they've acquired it they're going to go do things properly they even ask each other who's going to roll away the stone and not only when they get there has someone taken care of it for them it tells and communicates to them you don't need the spices anyway roll this back let them see god's message is i have great power sin comes over this world and even leaves of the world to die on a cross but it cannot conquer him does this change the way that we think it's the greatest and biggest moment in the world notice the invitation from uh, the, the angel in verse number six his message to the women don't fear stop being afraid I know you're looking for Jesus come and see come and see it again today that Jesus is risen to new life. Does it change the way you think and live? Does it change the way that you talk? Does it give you hope that God controls and rules this world? Regardless of what the news reports, regardless of what your friends try to get you to focus on, regardless of the discussion at the lunch table or wherever it may be, regardless of how down and dark things are, it had just been very dark few hours few days before in jesus in jesus death but his resurrection had such power it changed the outlook of the world should it not change the outlook of my day should it not change the outlook of my evening and my family does it bring us joy that he came for you we teach i'll just be frank and honest i've been grumpy off and on the last few months i've become grumpy I, there's all kinds of things i'm like oh customer service everywhere is bad food things are changing food doesn't even taste good anymore it certainly could have been because i had covid but whatever it may have been doesn't even taste good anymore i'm just blah. does the resurrection bring joy that hey when we get to eternity i'll be able to taste stuff normally again or whatever it may be 
Think of Hebrews 12, 1, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Do I look at the joy that Jesus brings in resurrected life and then endure this world without being nasty about it, without being always complaining, without being grumpy, without being mean, without being bitter, without being discouraged? Because it's powerful. Notice the second thing. Notice the greeting. The shaking says his resurrection is powerful. But the greeting tells us that his resurrection is personal. The woman came to the tomb that day from other passages we know and to anoint the body of Jesus with spices. And they were committed to Christ. It's clear what they believed, that they loved him. I don't know. I, it, some say, well, did they, were they going that day because they believed that he might raise from the dead. I, I don't know. It does say that they were going to anoint, they, they say his body. They assume at least that he's still dead and they know how long it has been at this point. It's been three days, they say. Notice the difference, though. For fear of the angel, the soldiers did their own shaking. The earth shook and then the soldiers shook. And notice that the angel does not offer them any solace or comfort. He does not say to them, oh, it's okay. You know, because at this point, maybe they become believers. I don't know. But at this point, they are not looking for Jesus. They're trying to guard Jesus. And so the angel's power reflects on, his, on their lives with fear and that it affects them. The world looks at the message of fear and with disgust like the religious leaders because there is no faith. But notice those that came looking for Jesus, what was the response his first words, the angel says to them, Don't fear, fear not ye, I know ye seek Jesus. He says this, stop being afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus. Come and see that he is not here. I don't know where you are in your spiritual life this morning. It'd be sad to preach a resurrection message and not include this invitation to you. What are you looking for this morning? Are you looking for life change? Are you looking for something better, some more meaning? You can't find any of those things until you find life in Christ. And as you look at the angel's message to these ladies is the same as it is to you today. Stop being afraid. Don't be caught up by the things of this life, its start date, its end date, and all the confusion in between. Stop being afraid. You're looking for Jesus. Now, you may not know that you're looking for him by name, but you're looking for satisfaction. You're looking for meaning. You're looking for hope. You're looking for life. You're looking for something beyond the confines of this world and this momentary life. And the Bible is telling you, whether you understand or not, you are looking for Jesus. So come and see. This morning, Christians, the message to us, stop being afraid. Jesus is alive and though we cannot go see, we can go see many tombs. We don't know exactly which tomb Jesus was buried in or even if it's still there, regardless of the claims of many uh, tourist places there in <laughs> Jerusalem. Uh, we don't know exactly where. Yes, you can go see empty tombs. You can go see all those things. But this is what he's saying. Come and see. Know me from my word. Know that I love you and I care about you and I long to know you and for you to know me. That is his message to you today. Stop just trying to reconfigure life based on some principles in the Bible. Let it change you. Seek Jesus. The resurrection is powerful, but it is also personal. Notice the third thing, the appearing. Jesus did not leave his followers simply to admire or wonder. He gave them purpose and loved them despite their failures. Notice the resurrection of Jesus also gives purpose. The resurrection is powerful, it is personal, and it gives purpose to our lives. Notice, there's mercy and grace and kindness in Jesus appearing. He doesn't say really anything different than the angel did, did he? <laughs> the angel said to them, go tell the disciples, he's going before you to Galilee, he will meet you there. Don't fear, don't be afraid, he is risen. And then when Jesus comes and intercepts the ladies as they're going it says they went with great fear reverence and all and great joy 
So they're going, wrestling with both of those emotions. We don't know what happened. We don't know how this happened, but we got to go tell somebody. And Jesus intercepts them on the way. It's as if maybe God gave that divine appointment to that angel. Tell the ladies this. And Jesus, not that he changed his mind, but Jesus intercepts and said, I don't want to let you see me myself. And, and there is joy and there's kindness. He doesn't tell them anything different. He still says, go tell my disciples. Meet me in Galilee. We'll take note of their reaction in a moment. Why were these ladies the first to see? Why did they know? There's a lot of writing on that. Why, why is it? What, was it because they were faithful? Because they kept going back? The disciples abandoned? Was it because of who they were? Or all these different things? Here, very simply, here's my esteemed assessment of it. Because they were there. <laughs> That's why they were the first. Because they were at the tomb. And because they were there. And Jesus loved them. He still wants to be with them. He still loves them. He still has purpose for them. He says that. You see that in his words. Go and tell my disciples. You know what's interesting? We read back in Matthew 26 several weeks ago. Matthew 26, 32, Jesus said to his disciples, After I am risen, I will go before you to Galilee. Now, what does he say in verses 9 and 10? He says, Greetings, all hail, rejoice. Verse 10, Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. What did Jesus say before and after the resurrection? Here's the great thing. Nothing has changed. I mean, think about that. The cross did not change Jesus Christ. I know some men, I know some people that have been captured, that have been prisoners of war. It changes you. You come out different, regardless of how strong you are. It doesn't mean it's always for bad. It doesn't always mean it's evil. It doesn't mean those things. But the fact that Jesus Christ suffered the greatest torment mentally, spiritually, physically, anguish that anyone could ever suffer and he did it for sinners that were mocking him and jeering him. He did it for disciples that were abandoning and running away. He did it for Peter who was denying. And he did it for us who sin against him constantly on a regular basis. And somehow his message to them before was, I will meet you in Galilee. And his message to them after is still, I will meet you in Galilee. Aren't you glad it's not up to your performance, but it is up to Jesus' grace. That his risen life is powerful, it is personal, and he gives us purpose in this world. His first message, essentially, paraphrase, the plan has not changed. Because it is not dependent on you. It's not about you. It's about me. Go obey, and you'll see me there. We're going to kind of blend this into next week, but I just want you to notice the response. Number four, last thing. The responses. We're going to actually work backwards for a moment. Verse 17, even there, some of his disciples, as they gathered on the mountain in Galilee, some worshipped him, some doubted. Are you doubting this morning? As a Christian, do you doubt God's purpose and plan for your life? If you're not a Christian, do you doubt that God is who he says he is in this Bible? Notice, some rejected and chose deceit. Verses 12 through 15. The elders took counsel and gave large money into the soldiers and paid them off, said if the governor finds out about it, we'll protect you. Why would they have to do It's another proof of the resurrection. Why would they have to pay and take care of it in the governor's eyes? If they didn't do their job, they're going to get punished by Pilate and the governor, right? That would be a fairly easy thing to go prove that you didn't fail at. Did you guard the dead body of Jesus? Yes, we did. Is he still there? No, he is not. <laughs> it's a fairly easy thing. Why does it need defending if he's still there? He's not there. There's so much to this. Why would the disciples suffer and go through torment over the next few years and give their lives for Jesus if they thought or knew that it was a lie? They lived what we read in Acts. They suffered. They suffered torment. They died for the cause of Christ. Why? Because they saw that he died and then lived again and they had heard his promise that if they die, they will live again. And so it removes fear. Yet some choose rejection and deceit. However, others saw him with reverence and fear, awe, 
It says, with great joy, the women went. And then notice how they responded with belief and worship. It says that the women saw him. All they knew to do said they held him by the feet. Oh, you're not going anywhere again. Would that we would long for Jesus so deeply that we would not let him go, that would not let his word go, that would not stray. And they worshiped him. And then he gives them instruction. And, and here's the kicker. How do they respond to the resurrection of Jesus? They obeyed him. They did what he said to do. <laughs> How have you responded to the resurrection of Jesus this week? How do you respond daily, weekly? Do you cling to his feet in worship? Did you come in this morning thinking about the fact that he's risen from the dead? I'll put you on the spot a little bit. We all get pulled away from what really matters. His first command is go and tell and then come and meet me there. How have you responded? We go and tell not just those that are lost, but each other. Did you notice that? Jesus' instruction to the women was go tell my brothers. Go tell the disciples. They need to be reminded too. It is not just the lost that need to hear of Jesus' resurrection. It's my heart. It's your heart. Warren Wearsby said, I'll close with two quotes. Warren Wearsby said, is, Easter is the truth, or resurrection is the truth that turns a church from a museum into a ministry. I pray that we will not be a museum where we gather with dead people to look at dead things, but that we would be alive because Jesus is alive. So let's go and serve and grow in Him. There's a poem. It's been turned into a song. I'll read to you as we finish. We don't have a description of the resurrection of Christ, but I like to imagine. It says this, His heart beats, His blood begins to flow, waking up once was dead, what once was dead moments ago. His heart beats. Now everything is changed because the blood that brought us peace with God is racing through his veins and his heart beats. He breathes in. His living lungs expand. The heavy air surrounding death turns to breath again. He breathes out. He is word and flesh once more. The lamb of God slain for us is now a lion ready to roar. So crown him the Lord of life. Crown him the Lord of all. Crown him the Lord of love. He took one breath and put death to death. Where is your sting? O grave, how grave is your defeat. He rises, glorified in flesh, clothed in immortality, the firstborn from the dead. He rises, and his work is already done, so he rests as he rises and reclaims the bride he's won because his heart beats. My favorite Stands are a line. His heart beats, and he will never die again. <laughs> I know that death no longer has dominion over him. So my heart beats with the rhythm of the saints as I look for the seeds that the king has sown to burst up from their graves. Aren't you thankful this morning for the promise of life in Christ? Lord, help us today. Move us. Change us. May we wait because your heart beats still. Because you leave, live, may we live. Because your lungs breathe, may we breathe for you and tell others. May it change us. May we be encouraged by your word this morning. May we go out desiring to shout hallelujah. To declare he is risen indeed. Wake us up. This changes our lives. Grant and give us a new look. Restore in us a new view of the risen Savior, the one that we have studied in Matthew teaches with such surety and kindness and truth and perfection that that sinless, perfect, precious lamb was slain for us. But as a lion with power lives for us today, May you change us and work in us. Christian, this morning, sometimes we just need to wake up. Sometimes we just need to smell it all again, to see it all again, to feel it all new for the first time, if the Lord will let us. So maybe this morning, the power 
of the resurrection has moved you. Maybe it is how personal it is. Maybe it is that it gives you purpose. There's a reason you're called to live the life you do. For those of you that may not be Christian in the room this morning, what does it take? This power can be yours. You can, by faith, know that in spite of physical death, you will live forever in Him. What He did one day, He will do for you. If you believe, there's nothing you can do to earn it, nothing you do to gain it. You can only receive it. So by faith, turning from our sin, recognizing I'm a sinner and I cannot fix that. I need a Savior. Trust in Him and Him alone. And then you have our invitations. You're welcome to come forward. We have people that will greet you, take you somewhere quietly off to the side and be able to help you know. I'll be waiting around after the service. We want you to know, to know, to know that you are born again in Christ. Lord, help us as we praise you in Jesus' name. Stand if you would. And I sing that same song again that we sang a few moments ago. What is our only hope in life and death? It is that Christ went through life and death and lives again. So may we declare that and sing it out here at this altar. May the Lord work in your heart and at your seat. Saved, unsaved, may the resurrection of Jesus give us power in life this morning. May we rejoice in it. Let's sing together. Sing victoriously, quickly. I know sometimes we sing an invitation. We want to sing it contemplatively. And we can do that in your own heart and mind. This is not a song that we can sing. We declare this. So let's sing it together. What is our hope? Christ, our hope in life and death. That is good truth in song this morning. Let's ask the Lord to bless us. Be back tonight, men's and ladies group at normal times and schedules. Uh, back this evening, men in the chapel, ladies in here. Uh, those church fellowships, there's still a couple spots even today. Sign up, let me know that you're coming or for one of those other dates as well. Um, Brother 